Good evening, everyone. It's uh, Christopher Hale uh, here in Rutherford County. Um, as you know, I am a candidate for United States Congress here in the 4th Congressional District. Uh, we have a great program tonight. But before we begin, I want to wish all the uh, mothers and grandmothers, aunts, uh, anyone who's a mother in any capacity, a happy Mother's Day throughout Tennessee in this country. Um, you know, a prophet of modern times said it pretty well. There are two gifts that parents can bequeath their children. One is roots and the other is wings. And um, I'm thankful for the women in my life who have given me both roots and wings in the context of this community as a Tennessean. And there's so many women who have, who have served this role and I'm very thankful for them. Um, we have a great program tonight. As I said, we have um, um, uh, Kendall Knight, who is the vice chair of the Marshall County Democratic Party. Uh, he also served as the chairman of the Democratic Party um, in 2017. 2018. Um, he has the respect of leaders across the community. He's a businessman. Um, he's someone who I think is going to be a future elected leader. Don't tell him that because he doesn't necessarily want to run. But it's also someone, you know, when I win this office, I'm going to go to and say, you know, Kendall, will you work for me? Will you be a community leader? Will you be my voice um, and ears and eyes on the ground in Marshall County and throughout the, the region? And uh, we'll, who knows if we'll accept, he'll accept or not. Maybe I'll ask him tonight. I um, just want to give you a, an idea of coming attractions before we get into this. Um, on Tuesday, on Monday, tomorrow night, we have Ms. Betty Fraley from Franklin County. On Tuesday, I have a former colleague and boss, actually, from the Obama campaign, for Obama World, World uh, Mr. Michael Weir. I'm going to be using these um, these interviews and these uh, well, nightly live streams to give you a sense of um, how I will govern, but also who I am. I think it's important that you look me up and down and investigate me, figure out who is this man? Who is this young man who is seeking this high honor of representing you in the United States Congress? So we're going to have folks that I've worked with in the past, both in Washington and also here in Tennessee, so they can give you a sense of a little bit of history of who I am. Um, but we're also going to be having leaders on different issues in the community. Next week, I'll have a few farmers on to talk about uh, trade wars and tariffs. On Wednesday, I'll be having uh, um, Mr. Jason Pickle, who will be talking about marijuana legalization and cannabis farming. Um, on Thursday, I'll have a, 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 young, a woman who I helped secure a 165000 PPP loan um, when Scott Desjardins did not answer the phone. So a lot of fun stuff coming, and I hope you'll join us. Um, we're going to be upgrading the studio. Um, not that I don't love my office here, um, but we want this to be running at the full capacity. So next week or two, we're going to be putting this at the highest quality available so that you can get to know uh, this young man who is seeking your support. Um, if you have any events that you want me to come to as we slowly come back into the fold of, of, of living daily life here in, in Tennessee, I'll be there. If you got a kid's bar mitzvah, give me an invitation. I'll show up and I will dance. Uh, First communion, I'll be in the pews. Uh, Little League championship games, I'll be there and cheering them on. You need a congressman that shows up. Uh, if you have a fish fry or barbecue, Congressman Desjardins, don't invite him. He ain't coming. But I will be there. And I want to meet you and your family that have not so, done so so far. And I want to be a man who shows up for his constituents. Um, but without further ado, um, I want to introduce Mr. Kendall uh, Knight. Kendall, are you there? Perfect. Kendall, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You, you moved to Marshall County as a young man. Can you tell me about growing up in the community and a little bit about your background? Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, I appreciate all the kind words on the intro. Uh, but like you, before I begin, I want to say uh, a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, my own mom, my mother-in-law, and 
of course, my wife, uh, she's an incredible wife and a great mother. So I really appreciate her, her and I want to wish her a happy Mother's Day, uh, along with all the mothers out there. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, like you mentioned, I moved to Marshall County, I was about two years old. So I've basically been a Marshall County resident my entire life. Uh, I met my wife here, I raised my kids here, uh, went to public schools throughout the county. Uh, in college, I went a little bit east. I went to Tennessee Tech in Cookville, uh, where I got my undergraduate degree in economics and my MBA in finance. Uh, I went to college during the middle of the Great Recession and the financial crisis. So um, I really, we really studied that, that a lot. And that's when I became politically involved, uh, was going through that process and seeing how the economy was was affecting people's lives and seeing what the Obama administration was trying to do to help people's lives. So that was kind of how I came politically involved. And then I came back to Marshall County. Uh, I, I do work around the area. I do economic and financial analysis uh, for a financial institution. Uh, so still keeping the, those skills around. And that's that's kind of how I, um, I view the political landscape and policy. Uh, and that's what drew me to being a Democrat and being politically involved. Well, it's interesting too. So, Kendall, you um, you were a leader. You were a leader of the party, but you've also you've also been a community leader your entire life. Um, you've all had the coronavirus. We've all had the coronavirus. But I want to talk a little bit about the specifics of what's going on in Marshall County. What are the number of infections? What is what is life looking like? Um, have you all returned to basic normalcy of life? What was it like the past month? Uh, well, we are fortunate in Marshall County. We only have twenty four confirmed cases. Um, but there are a lot of people in Marshall County who do commute for, for their work. Uh, so the counties that border us to the north, Williamson, Rutherford, uh, they do have more cases. And, and obviously we have people commuting there, uh, even going up to Davidson County and, and beyond. So most of the concern from what I hear is people who are worried about having to commute to work and going to those places that seem to have more, uh, more cases. As far as getting back to normal here, just like every community, there are some business owners, restaurants that are, that are slowly beginning that process and trying to do it safely. Uh, but there are still some that are, that are closed or for restaurants, for instance, just doing the takeout. Uh, so people are, they're coming back to normal, but there's still that hint of caution, just like there probably is throughout the state, throughout the country. Yeah, it's interesting. I have, I have seen in Rutherford County, I've been across this entire district, as you know, this district stretches, stretches far east uh to to murray county and south of lincoln and, and, and franklin county and all the way uh all the way east uh to um to ray county and bradley county i have noticed in rutherford county life is picking up i am concerned to be honest i think it's hard um it's, it's hard for our leaders our business leaders and our, our our um our government leaders to know that balance between um having um having, you know, openness and, and, and ability to participate in the economy, but also protecting people's lives and, and the hard balance. And we will see, unfortunately, w without much control about how that happens throughout the summer, spring and summer. We don't know a lot, obviously, about what that will happen. I was glad to see that Marshall County two weeks ago had it seemed like a pretty successful um, state run coronavirus testing site. Um, but uh, Kendall, I want to ask you, what are issues that have, have been have, that you think are coming to the forefront of Marshall County that before the virus, um, after the virus? What are, some, what are some lasting issues that you think I should be focused on if I'm elected to the position in the United States? Congress? Yeah, uh, here in Marshall County, we are, we are really unique. Uh, we have really unique communities, but just like a lot of other rural communities, we, we share some of the problems. Uh, Oh, probably first and foremost is healthcare. Uh, we are fortunate we have a Marshall County Medical Center uh, in Lewisburg, um, and that has stayed open when a lot of other rural hospitals have closed. So that's a 25 bed facility, uh, and it, it was up until the COVID-19 pandemic started. It was it was open and still operational, um, but we know that we're fortunate. There's a lot of other communities that still don't have that that healthcare facility close to them, uh, but that's always a concern because we see how many of those have closed. So uh, that's that's on the forefront of, of people's minds here in Marshall County, uh, as well as infrastructure. Uh, I saw your your town hall with Mariah Phillips uh, a few days ago, and we're having some of the same issues that they had in, and you guys had in Rutherford County previously. Uh, there is a lot of growth, particularly on the northern side of the county, um, as you know, aff housing affordability becomes an issue close to Nashville, and it's it's moving further south. Um, so as as these houses and these these um, housing units are being built, 
our infrastructure is being pushed to the limit. That's traditional, whether it's roads, particularly water. Um, there's concerns about what we do with our water supply. Um, uh, there's sanitation and landfill waste issues uh, that people have brought up. And then in addition to those traditional infrastructure issues, we have digital infrastructure, which I know that's something that you mentioned, and I'm glad to hear that you speak so much about it. Um, in Marshall County, the last data that I have seen that only 70% of our residents have access to broadband internet. Uh, that's about 10, po 10 points less than the national average and about 15 points less uh, than national and more urban areas in the state. Um, and so that kind of feeds into the next point is education is, is a concern. Um, in this current situation, uh, there's a lot of remote learning going on, but if you don't have access to quality, affordable, it's like healthcare, quality, affordable um, broadband, then that's going to be very difficult for teachers and for students. Uh, and that will leave some of those most vulnerable people behind because they don't have access. Uh, so that is a concern, the traditional and digital infrastructure. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, and also our education, there seems to be uh, somewhat of a lesser priority from the state and federal level uh, on education recently. And, and the schools in our communities, there, there's a lot of pride involved with them. We're proud of our uh, the alumni uh, from, you know, prominent students. And we have, you know, some athletes, people are proud of, you know, uh, I went to this school and, you know, so-and-so went here and we're proud of that. But if, if our schools, you know, kind of maintain that, we need to keep them up and uh, keep them going. So that's always a concern. It's interesting too, you talked about the, uh, the broadband issue. So 70% of your community has broadband. It's one in three that do not. Um, it's, I mean, you gotta think about it. You guys, when did you all stop schools? In Rutherford, we stopped on March 15, give or take. When did you all stop schools in Marshall County around the same time? It was, it was around that same time. Yeah, I'm not sure. The date. Well, I mean, and so you have two months essentially where, you know, we're, we're running uh, optional, obviously we're running online educational programs, but if you have a situation where one in three, you know, students cannot participate in this, you're, you're, you're leaving folks behind. And one thing we do not know yet, we hope, we got willing, we hope that all schools are open in the fall semester. Um, I have Becky Goff, who is a Murfreesboro City School um, director here um, on this live stream a couple of weeks ago. And that's the hope. But there, there is contingencies in place. But all those contingencies rely on our students being able to have access to the internet. You know, to me, uh, it, um, one of the ideas that I put forward is the Tennessee Valley Authority in the 20th century, it did three things. Uh, it lit up the sky, um, it created jobs, and it cut poverty in half. That infrastructure of the Tennessee Valley Authority is a great way of, of providing broadband to, to rural communities. The reality of it is, is it's got to be 100% fully accessed. To me, it comes close to a public utility. There's fights about whether or not it should be but to not have internet, to not have ability to access the internet, it's causing such inequalities in the community and students suffer. Um, Mark, uh, Kendall, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, can you go back to the water issues and explain that a little bit more in detail in terms of the, the, there's issues about, if I understand correctly, about accessing fresh water in the community. Can you explain that a little bit more to me? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. There's uh, there's a lot of issues. There's build, they're building a lot of housing and there were prior to the, uh, the beginning uh, prior to this COVID pandemic, um, they're they're building a lot of housing, uh, and there's concerns that are we going to run out of fresh water? Um, here we have uh, the Duck River that runs through Marshall County, and that's the Duck River is one of the most, bi if not the most, biologically diverse river in the country, or possibly the continent. Um, and you know, are we willing to to sacrifice, or what are we going to? What strains would we put on our natural resources uh, to keep these? houses being built, um, you know, is it sustainable? And that's the question we have to ask. Of course, we want more people to move in. We love our community. We want more people to come in and enjoy it. But we have to weigh the options of, is it sustainable? Can we keep building the house when, when someone goes to turn on the water? Will there be water? Will it be fresh? Will it, will it be sanitary? Uh, so there's, oh, there's a lot of concern about that. Um, I know, like I said, in the northern side of the county, they're building a lot of houses because the, uh, the affordability is pushing it down. And then with the large manufacturing facilities they built in northern Alabama, there are people moving into the southern part of the county, uh, all the way from, said, from northern Alabama all the way up to Marshall County. So uh, that's going to be another issue we have to look at is it's kind of coming from all sides. Where are we going to get our natural resources to uh, to provide for these new new Marshall County residents? We're glad to have them, uh, but it has to be sustainable. Uh, and we don't want to, 
get them here and then have everyone disappointed that they made the decision to come here because we know it's a great place to live. Uh, we just have to make sure we do it and it's manageable. Well, it's interesting to me. I think one of the things that is remarkable about protecting the rural way of life is you see some basic realities. A lot, I mean, so um, you and I are both millennials. Um, I live in a suburban area, but what's interesting is I, I'd imagine that a lot of your friends that are around our age that live in, in Marshall County, a lot of them probably have um, uh, uh, remote work, the equivalent of remote work that allows them to live in this community. So that the, the job market looks very different, obviously, um, in, in 2020 than in, in even 2000. But yeah, that's a baseline reality. You've got to have access to hospitals good schools, um, running water, the ability to have a good home, et cetera. There's some basic amenities that should be just uh, guaranteed to be a community. I wanted to talk to you a little bit on, on the um, on the question of hospital. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Marshall Medical Center. What is the state of that? How are, how are things doing within within the context of it? Is it how is it going? It, it has, has COVID been tough on it? What what, how, what is what is the like, Medicaid expansion been for the community like? Um, how is the hospital doing? The system doing itself? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I know. I know a little bit. I know that it's it we're, it's still operational. Uh, of course, with the with the the Corona and the the COVID nineteen uh, concerns, I believe the entire it's it's under the umbrella of the Murray Regional Medical Center, uh, and they've cut out a lot of elective um, medical availability. Even though I've spoke with some people and the issues that they and the procedures and the screenings they're not making available, I wouldn't consider elective. I know some people that that are waiting for result, test results or had an issue going on and they're not able to to follow up on that. And they said Marshall County we only have 24 cases, which we're very fortunate. Um, so we don't. There's not a major concern on that as far as the hospital, um, but it's it's been a lot of concern of people wanting to go about their normal medical lives and they have ongoing issues that that this is putting a lot of strain on them um so as far as i know the the, the covid uh, issue hasn't overrun the hospital um so we're fortunate there as far as uh medicaid expansion uh medicare sorry we, that's something that i know throughout the community people it seems like a no-brainer you know if we could come and we can get those that federal funding that which is going to other states that we're paying into uh, and we're not getting simply because of ideologues that, that think that anything that has to do with the federal government and helping uh, residents is, is bad is just beyond me that we haven't we haven't delved into those funds and kept the all these rural hospitals open or even expanded them. You know, we can offer all these rural communities even better health care. Um, rural communities tend to have more people on disability or unable to work. And a lot of that, you know, if we had that funding, we could actually be more productive. Uh, throughout our communities, you know, economic, we'd have higher standards of living if we could access those funds. But the fact that we have some elected representatives who feel like just because it's federal money or it's taxpayer money, it, it can't be used. And it's it's simply because they don't like the idea of it. It's just an ideologue holdup. It, it's beyond me. Yeah, I mean, I got to be honest. I think, I think it's the fact that Barack Obama was the one who signed the bill into law. I really do think it's a partisan issue that is not based on simple math. To me, I mean, it's remarkable to me. I mean, Republicans call themselves pro-life. Well, if you want to expand the dignity of life in rural communities in rural Tennessee, expand Medicare. I mean, expand Medicaid. It will, it will save rural hospitals. It will save tax dollars, pay dollars. It will save human lives. And it's remarkable to me that the, our, you know, our state governments refuse to do it. One of the things that I want to transition, and I think that's one of the things that has been my whole uh, theory that I, that I operate on. There's really, our, our founders imagined two roles of members of Congress. Number one, they were lawmakers. They were passing laws and they, they were, they were uh, writing legislation and, and doing that. But the second thing is, uh, historically, uh, a member of Congress spent eight months out of the year at home. They were advocates within their community. So they would knock on Governor Lee's door and say, this is what's going on in my community, and I'm going to use the power of my pulpit, the power of my congressional pen, the authority given to me by the Constitution to tell you the fight for my people. So you use an advocate role. Obviously, the federal government has left it through the states and because of, because of the 2012 um, uh, Supreme Court ruling, each state can decide whether or not they expand Medicaid. If I get elected, 
you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be on Billy's butt every day telling him that I am a, I am a someone who, who won in my community because the people want health care. Um, for me, the, the health care and hospitals, good jobs and living wages are no longer questions in this context of the times of left versus right, but right versus wrong. And uh, Kendall, I have a question for you. Have you ever met Congressman Desjardins? Have you ever met him? Has he ever come to Marshall County? Have you ever seen him? Not that I'm aware. I've never met him. Um, he has popped in for a campaign event, possibly, um, but I'm not aware of him having much of a presence in Marshall County. I don't know of anybody that's met him. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about it is that, you know, I think that I I ran for Congress in 2018. I'm back here again in 20. Um, so in some degree, I'm a political newcomer in some capacity, but the work I've done in the past two and a half years, I would bet and the work that we'll do in the next six months that you will find in me already in the context of a campaign, someone who's shown up, who will who will show up and talk to anyone, anywhere, and will 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 be close to our people. And it's always been a deep frustration to me that Congressman Dejarle, overcome by scandal, has been effectively hidden um, in his mansion in South Pittsburgh and his expensive home in Northern Virginia consistently for the past decade. We paid him $1.7 million. And the only thing we've gotten from him is he renamed the post office, thank God, but he's never sponsored any meaningful legislation in his time. I think in terms of some of the biggest waste of taxpayer dollars, one's not expanding Medicaid, and two is giving Congressman Desjardins a paycheck every 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 two weeks. Um, Kendall, if I'm elected, what do you want from me? What would you want for me to really fight for uh, in Marshall County? Well, I look, I look at it in two, two different areas. One is leadership, like you said, that, that we should look at our elected representatives as you know, a leader within the community. And I, we don't see that currently from Scott Desjardins. That's even people I have a lot of growing, you know, being in this rural area and, and knowing the demographic, there are a lot of Republicans. And I don't know a lot of them that are saying that they're proud to know that Scott Desjardins is a representative. It's something you look at and you say, hey kids, this is a good role model, uh, not, don't feel that he particularly shows any leadership skills. He's basically been a GOP rubber stamp his entire tenure. It's not an independent thought. There's no analysis. It's, okay, boss, tell me where I vote, when to be there, and I'll do it, um, in addition to having very little involvement in our communities. So what I look for from you would be first would be the leadership aspect. And I know that you can do it because in the in the – the few years that I've known you, we've seen you in Marshall County several times. You're, you're, you're there, you're available. Um, we know who you are. Um, and secondly, to uh, to look at it, and since you've talked to the people, you know what really comes down to the kitchen table issues that we're really looking to solve, whether it's whether it's healthcare, expanding healthcare, or the digital digital infrastructure that we discussed. These things that that would help uh, the inequality issues that we see in our country uh, and throughout the fourth district. And I know that. That's something, those two things you'll tackle the leadership and getting to the priorities that we have in the fourth district. And that's, that's what we look for from you. Well, I appreciate that. I think um, also too, I want everyone to know that we're seeing your comments. I'm seeing your comments. So if you have any particular questions about Marshall County, um, about my camp candidacy or for Kendall himself, we'll take them. And Kendall, um, we're coming towards the last couple of minutes here. Um, I want to ask you, um, if you were my campaign manager, if you were running this campaign, um, what advice do you have for me? I think one of the things that me and my my team that's coming together, we had conversations over this past week. Um, essentially, I need 40,000 Trump hail voters. Um, whether or not that means 2016 Trump, 2020 hail, or 2020 Trump, 2020 hail, I need them. Um, and so, you know, I, I want every Democrat on, on God's green earth to vote for me. Um, I want every independent on God's green earth to vote for me, but I also want the vote of, of Trump voters. And, and, you know, one of the issues that's been really interesting to me is the only time uh, uh, Scott Desjardins goes against the president of the United States is when the president of the United States has a great idea to help Tennesseans. Um, he voted against President Trump's uh, free coronavirus test. He voted against President Trump's pretty good small business stimulus. He voted against President Trump's idea to have paid family leave. Um, so I wanted to get a sense of you. How do I win over those voters? Like, what do I do? How can I be, can be victorious in Marshall County outright uh, this November? Nope. Lost you there.
Well, I would say get get to know get to know the people which you, which you've started, but more importantly, get to know the people that maybe aren't um, that already aren't aren't partisan. Some of those people who are independent that are out there that that maybe that aren't political junkies or, or news junkies that that aren't set in their ways. You know, get to know those people um, because a lot of the issues that they have are issues that everyone has, uh, and they come they come from a different viewpoint they look at it as what's best for for my family and what's best for me not necessarily what's best for my 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 political thought process going into it there's not as much bias there and those are the people that you get a lot of honest feedback from where uh whether it's democrats or republicans there are some people that are going to fall in that group think uh, mentality but if you really get to know the people uh you know the real people in the fourth district you'll get some probably some some odd answers or other priorities and what they're looking for, but you get honest, you get the truth, uh, because they want to know that th- what they're concerned about will be brought up, and they're not afraid to tell you that. And I've seen you out on the campaign trail. I've seen you in Marshall County, and I see you talk to everybody. Um, I've seen you talk to people who who aren't necessarily Democrats uh, that I know are Republicans, and you're not afraid to talk to them and get their thought process. But to really get out there and get those independent people. Um, I think it's really important. It would show, uh, you know, that the people come before parts in politics. Well, I think that's what's been so impressive about your leadership that I've seen is that um, uh, your leadership over the, uh, the party and within the party is that you, Kendall Knight's not a, uh, what is it? He's not a partisan firebrand. Um, you're in politics. You participate in politics from, you said from the get-go at Tech um, and, and now here um, back home. It's because it's in service of the people. I always, you know, I always, I, I'm, I love the Greek uh, word for politics. It really means politics actually means from care from one end of the community to the other poles, so two ends of the community. You've always, you've always, uh, uh, I think, you know, from my experience, been a champion of that reality. Kendall, I do have a good question from you. Um, this is from a man named Sean in, on Twitter. Uh, Sean asked Kendall. Um, what is your view of whether or not the state of Tennessee is doing enough to to address the coronavirus in Marshall County? I'm sorry, a little technical difficulty there. What was it? Yeah, Kendall, if you can hear me, can you hear me better? Can you hear me now? Okay. I can the question that. was, essentially, have you gotten enough resources from the state in the context of the coronavirus? And there's actually a second part of it. What do you think? What What do you think? The, what do you think the coronavirus will do to challenge the Marshall County economy in the months to coming ahead? What will that look like? I, I lost you again during the question. I'm sorry. So they were asking, "What do you think the coronavirus is going to do to the economy in Marshall County?" Did you get that part? I know. Catch any of that? Sorry. That's okay, um, Kendall. Um, Let's see. Can you hear me now? Why about now? Okay. Well, actually, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll have go ahead, Kendall, and we'll thank you for joining us. And the technical difficulties are on my side, um, not yours. But we really appreciate you being here with us and, and giving me an update um, on what's going on in Marshall County. And God willing, I will be down there in my Chevy soon enough. So, Kendall, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, I want to talk directly to you all. Um, about the updates on the campaign and where we're going and what life's going to look like. Um, we're on fire. Um, we are on fire. We are having. We are creating a campaign that's going to beat Scott Desjardins like a drum on November third, and then I'm going to fight like hell to make life better for you and your family. Um, we we have over four thousand people that have signed up through our website for this campaign in every county in our community in the first days and weeks of this campaign. Um, we have donors from every county. Um, there's three things that you can do right now. I'm asking you to do it right now. Uh, number one, please go to ChristopherHale.com. Sign up uh, to get on our email list, our volunteer list, but we need your resources. Scott Desjardins is the champion of folks who who um, who get driven to work in limousines um, and take showers in the morning. Um, I am the champion of those who drive themselves to work and take showers at night, working men and women of Tennessee. Scott Desjardins is funded by the rich and the powerful. I am funded by you and your family. The average contribution to this campaign over the first two weeks, two and a half weeks, has been $34. 
you don't have to get 34. If you can give me $5 a month, it means a lot. I'm not going to be using that myself. I'm going to be using it to build the campaign to win this election and to bring generational change to Tennessee and this country. So I need you to go to ChristopherHale.com and give what you can, even if it's $5 one time. Um, we will make you proud. It's an investment, not in just me, but in our future, in our community. Um, and, and also sign up um, to get a sign. You can do that at ChristopherHale.com slash Hail Yes. These are the most popular signs in Tennessee politics. And they're really great because what it does is it, it gets people excited. It gives people um, a, information about me. Um, and it gives them a chance to look up, up our campaign. We're going to win this election. Uh, Scott Desjardins doesn't know you. He's never shown up. He doesn't know you and you don't know him. But you know me and I know you. And most importantly, you know that I will fight like hell for you. So I need you in my corner. Let's win this election. Let's bring generational change to our community. Let's get health care and hospitals, rural jobs, and living wages for every Tennessean. Um, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow night. We're going to win this. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.